people get lost in the, in the, in the music and they practice and they practice and they lose track of time. You need to build breaks. You need to take breaks. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm Jason Heath, and I'm so glad that you're here today. And check out everything we've done for the past decade plus at our website, ContrabassConversations.com. So many people that listen to this have gotten in touch with me, and I really appreciate it. And if you haven't before, I would love to hear from you. My email is feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. Send me a message. Let me know where you're from, what you're up to, any ideas for the show, any guests that you think would be great to have on here. That would be great. And you are going to love today's episode featuring Dr. Randy Kurtz, who is the primary physician at Healthcare Specialists Limited and is located in Niles, Illinois, just outside of my old hometown, Chicago. Randy is also a bass player, and he's presented numerous times at the International Society of Bassist Convention. He's the author of The Bassist Guide to Injury Management, Prevention, and and better health, and he creates regular videos for the ISB's Body and Bass series. He and I dig into all kinds of topics like injury prevention, keeping in good physical shape, how to practice intelligently to avoid injury, and much more. It was a wonderful conversation. Before we dig in, I'd like to thank our sponsor, D'Addario Strings, and let you know about our Kaplan String giveaway. D'Addario is giving away 10 sets of Kaplan Strings to Contrabass Conversations listeners. So if you'd like a chance to be entered, visit ContrabassConversations.com slash strings and fill out the survey and you'll be entered. These Kaplan strings, if you haven't played them before, they're wonderful strings. They're stranded steel core strings. They work great for pizzicato and arco. They provide clarity and warmth in in all registers. And they are used by so many former Contrabass Conversations guests. I don't even know where to begin. Craig Butterfield, Daniel Kimbrough, Volkan Orhan, Kurt Maroki, Klaus Freudenstein. I mean, the list goes on and on. David Allen Moore. They have C extensions available. You can get them in light, medium, and heavy tension, as well as solo tuning. They are designed, engineered, and crafted like all the narrow strings in their New York facilities. So thanks, guys, for sponsoring the podcast. Really appreciate it. I'd also like to welcome our newest sponsor, the Bass Violin Shop, and they're located in Greensboro, North Carolina. They offer sales and appraisals of new and used double basses, and they have the Southeast's largest inventory of basses, laminate basses, hybrid basses, and carved double basses. So whether you're in search of the best entry-level laminate or a fine pedigree instrument, there's always a unique selection ready for you to try. Trade-ins and consignments are also welcome. And you can check them out online at BassViolinShop.com. So great to have you on board, guys. That, again, is BassViolinShop.com. And I'd also like to let you know about Rosin Saver, which is a revolutionary storage device. It keeps your bass rosin feeling as fresh as the day it was made. I've been using Rosin Saver the, for the past several months, and it works great. I love it. I got my pops in there. It's got that great sticky quality that pops has right when you get it, especially if you get it super fresh. And mine feels just as fresh as the day I put it in Rosin Saver. Now, Rosin Saver is used by members of top orchestras like the New York Philharmonic, Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, the Concertgebouw, Cleveland Orchestra, Seattle Symphony, Toronto Symphony, and the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And if you go to rosinsaver.com and enter the promo code HEATH, that's H-E-A-T-H, at checkout, you get 10% off any and all orders. That's, again, promo code HEATH at rosinsaver.com. All right, here we go with our conversation featuring Dr. Randy Kurtz. I've followed along ever since you started doing the, the videos for ISB, so congratulations on that. That's very cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, um, and it's a pleasure to do them. I, I love doing them and uh, uh, always coming up with new stuff and uh, just the whole thing. It's, it's a joy. It's, uh, it's now no work at all and a uh, pleasure. And the, the feedback has been great. So it's, it's really, really just a fantastic experience for everybody, I think. 
I'm, yeah, I'm sure. And I see you're, you're you're doing a session at ISB this summer, aren't you? You're doing yes, uh, I am. Yeah, that's yeah. that's great. Yeah, anatomy of a bassist is that what it's going to be? It's yeah. anatomy of a bassist. Okay. Uh, essentially, what happens is I've sort of I've done the last few I conference in my Penn State. So this will be maybe my fourth one. Then that sounds about right, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's right. So essentially, I, I sort of put together a rough game plan because they want you to name it something. But then it all just kind of comes together. And whoever shows up, uh, I will give a brief talk about what's on my mind at that moment. And then I'll invite people up to play. I usually, uh, I'm not, usually I always borrow a bass from David Gage, very kind to lend me a bass for the event. And uh, uh, people will come in and uh, I'll watch him play and uh, make comments and and uh, show a couple things and uh, it's it's kind of a an open thing. Um, this time I've decided to call it anatomy of a bassist again simply because I called it something else every year, you know, stuff you should know or whatever. And uh, you know, I want people to uh, to be engaged maybe people that, uh, that have been there in the past to come back. What I intend to do is to show, um, if people want to come up and play, that's great, but I intend to demonstrate uh, with like a, an iPad and uh, uh, one of those, those pencil things that you draw over them with, the main muscles that are engaged when one is playing the bass. So I can talk about how if you uh, are in this position, your wrist may cramp up and this muscle is going to tighten up, or when you lean on this side, your back muscle, etc., etc. But that's sort of a general thing that people uh, will take something from and try to correct. But if they go to see somebody to try to fix it, if the person doesn't have expertise in that area or in the playing of a musical instrument, they're just going to kind of do a general job and it may or may not work out. This way I can say, okay, you tell them your rhomboids are being engaged when you move your scapula or something like that. And, and this way it'll be the lingo will translate to whoever the practitioner is trying to address the problem. So I think that that'll be pretty useful. I think it's super interesting, like watching your videos and seeing all the various um, uh, things you talk about. One thing I've thought about is like, I used to sit for a really long time when I played, you know, talking upright bass. And then I've been standing the last few years. I'm just curious, like, are different muscles being engaged, like in different ways? Do you see different, like, what do you see in, in terms of maybe just differences between people who sit and stand with the upright bass? Uh, well, different muscles are being engaged, certainly. Um, uh, the same muscles, perhaps, to perform essential motions on the base, uh, pressing down on the fingerboard, moving the bow, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the main differences between sitting and standing are going to be postural in that are you leaning on something? Are you bending over in a certain way? You have to put your arm at a different angle, perhaps, when you're sitting and standing. And then you get into the variables, such as, is the instrument the right size? What kind of stool do you have? Are your feet flat? There's, there's a lot of different things that go into it. But essentially, the motions of playing the bass will change only to the degree that they need to be exaggerated or lessened according to your uh, standing or sitting posture, right? Okay, okay, sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but what, what was fascinating to me, and I'm, I've known of you for some time, but I've just subscribed to your podcast. I mean, all this is, our courtship has happened rather quickly here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, I was so glad to see, to see uh, your email because I have a list of people that I've been meaning to get in touch with and that have been recommended to me, and you have been both somebody that I've been wanting to get in touch with, and I've had several people recommend. So I got the email, I'm like, perfect, let's set something up, let's talk. That, that's great, I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled to do this. Um, uh, what I saw what was fascinating, though, was your you had one podcast and, and you had pictures in which you described different varieties of standing and sitting. Like you had maybe a half a dozen different ways 
of standing where I tend to kind of say, okay, if you have the base flat against your body, it's going to make your left wrist curve more, uh, something like that. If you put it flat again, meaning the uh, the side of the base. Uh, if you put the back of the base against you, you're going to have to reach around too much with the right, and then again, all the bowing variables, etc. Um, so I've got kind of three positions that I kind of think about, and you have taken it into, uh, I believe six was what you had. And that was really interesting to me because that is something that I probably wouldn't have had the patience to do. <laughs> so you, you, you broke it, you broke it down really nicely. And in fact, I was going to suggest that maybe if you're going to be at the, uh, at the ISB, you come by the lecture and, and I can show, uh, some of these variations on you in real time. I think that'd be cool if you'd like to join me. I, I would love to join you. And yeah, that's fun. That, I think I had a couple hours free that day and I had a, my camera and I decided to just geek out and really, you know, and, and one thing I didn't, uh, explore because I've never really used it, but is the lavery end pins, you know, the bent end pins where, where people are standing with those. Like how do you notice a big difference in like what's engaged or how people are managing the base when they're using those end pins, the bent end pins? From what I know of those end pins, and there seem to be, it, it doesn't seem that there are, but there seem to be endless variations thereof. And the people that I ask about them, they 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 want to uh, explore it from a pedagogical sense as well. You know, well, it was introduced by so and so, and this guy did this, and then they bent it another degree and a half, and then they replaced it with cork, and like all this stuff, which is really interesting, but. Again, uh, as you asked the question, from my perspective, it's how does this affect what you do in your posture, okay? So if Rabat is using uh, a bed dead pen, and you might say, okay, well, uh, that works for him because he's sitting and he's sort of got his own method and his own approach, which works for him, which also includes if I'm correct, and please correct me if I'm incorrect in any of these things, uh, collapsing the fingers, which is not a generally recommended thing to do. And again, this is I'm going from memory, so if I'm incorrect in these things, uh, I don't need to be, and, and uh, uh, it fits in the whole picture only to say that the bent end pin seems to accompany other variations when people utilize them. Um, People are using the wooden one, like the dowel, right? And that's obviously fixed. Uh, it's not going to be uh, adjustable from there. Some of them, I believe, have some give. I know that I know people out there are very knowledgeable about them, and I am not only to the degree that I can tell you that if you angle the base in such a way that it fits your body better, and you can play better and avoid bending parts of your body that you don't want to bend, such as your wrist, forearms, your back, et cetera, et cetera, and it makes it easier for you, then I'm all for it. Um, I am not a stickler for technique, and I am not a one to teach technique. Uh, I am one to take something that people have brought me and say, okay, I think I can improve this without it affecting your playing too much, and make you a better player and less prone to injury. And it usually works out that way. And I think the end pin falls into that category. Well, and speaking of injuries, and I, I've been so fortunate in my playing, I've never practiced enough to have it be an issue, but like I've been pretty much injury free and I might be kind of in the minority there. I mean, I, my wife is a harpist and she's had hand issues and uh, colleagues I know, you know, they've struggled with different things. What, uh, like, what are some of the, and I know you've thought about this a lot, like what are some of the maybe top two or three things that cause basis? problems? Is it like overplaying? Is it bending at the wrists? Like what do you see come up again and again? Yeah, I, I think it's all of the above. Uh, first of all, a lot of people don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, and, and even people that I treat, uh, there's a confidentiality thing which suits me uh, very well. But hey, people don't want people that may potentially hire them or may potentially uh, utilize them or a position that they're already in to know that they're having problems and they want to keep it under their hat. So people don't really talk about it. 
or they just figured that's the way it's supposed to be. There used to be, and I've seen this change quite a bit uh, in the last decade or so, there used to be this kind of mentality where uh, teachers would would not consider this kind of thing because there wasn't a lot of information about it. And also, this is what I did, and this is what you're going to do, and uh, suck it up, and that's too bad, and ha-ha, it's your time now, that kind of thing. Right, you know? right. uh, th- there seems to have been quite a bit of that. And as times change uh, and ideologies change, uh, that seems to have gone by the wayside. Uh, people are getting more knowledge and they want to tell people, don't do it this way so you can avoid what happened to me. Um, in my book, uh, I had an incredible interview with Putter Smith, who was one of my teachers, who really had uh, almost potentially career-ending injuries that uh, that put him out of the game for a while. And there's many people, uh, especially at the conventions or via email, people that will approach me with similar stories. So I think the old timers, it was just keep playing and keep playing and then play some more. And it wasn't about play it this way uh, or about you can don't bend your hand. It was about just keep playing. Also, the method books uh, were not as varied as there are now, right? It was it was some handle strictly for the longest time, and there wasn't podcasts and videos and the internet and uh, bass related magazines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was here's your instrument, uh, do the best you can, and people and people either had teachers uh, or they didn't or whatever it may be, but it was more harder better and. This led to lifetime habits. So people now, it's a go-to kind of thing. They they don't or don't want to change what they do. And that's why I try not to delve into technique, because then you're going to get into a lot of arguments about what you should and shouldn't do. Whereas I can tell you unequivocally, if you don't bend your wrist as much, it's not going to hurt as much. You know, and, and and it's not going against anybody's sort of ideology. It's just common sense, and it's okay to give yourself a break. Also, people get lost in the in the in the music, uh, and they practice and they practice and they lose track of time. You need to build breaks. You need to take breaks, even when you're playing. Let's say you have an intensive gig that you just have to keep playing and you can't stop. Okay, well, there's going to be a minute or 30 seconds somewhere where you're going to be able to take a micro sort of break, right? Somebody else may be copying another section of the orchestra, may be playing whatever it is. At that moment, instead of staying in that ready, rigid tight position, ready to, to kick it in again, if you just drop your shoulders and shake out your hands, that breaks patterns that are have been established by what you've been doing and gives you like a second wind. Um, and people don't think about that because they're concerned about the music. They're concerned about the performance. They're concerned about whatever's going on in their head rather than, than themselves as the instrument. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing because I think people get so tied up in that moment. And you're right. There's, there's going to be 30 seconds in just about any musical situation or a minute or hopefully more where you can reset like that. But I think people, their, their, their brains in the game, they're not, they're not, met, but it's got to be, you know, it's like that cumulative effect if you don't get a chance to release. Right, right. And it's awareness of this situation. It's awareness of the fact that, hey, drop your shoulders, shake out your arms. Uh, it's awareness of these things, okay? It's the same as learning scales and modes. You learn them and then you just play them. Well, I teach people essentially in a lot of cases how to breathe, how to walk, how to hold themselves because it's stuff they don't think about. They've been doing a certain way all their life. Once you get it into your body, in your brain, as repetition, you don't have to think about it again. Uh, But you have to consciously, first of all, know it exists, then assimilate it, and then practice it, and then you, you go do what you need to do, you know. But uh, but you have to have an awareness, which is what it starts with, which I think uh, is one of the most valuable things that I that I can bring to anybody's uh, repertoire. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I've, I had the chance to interview several people who've struggled with performance-related injuries and have been very open about it. Well, the principal bass of the Houston Symphony, Robin Kesselman, he had he had some you know nerve issues that basically he couldn't really play using his left arm for about a year while he was studying. Another bass player in the Oregon Symphony has struggled while, while she was in school too. And it was interesting talking to them because it didn't seem like it was any one thing, but it was like the cumulative effect of a lot of things, like not sleeping as much, not eating right, not really exercising, practicing a little bit too much. Um, and then, and then, the, and so I think a lot of people, and I, some of my former students, real I've talked to, they get into this, this pattern where they're, they're very busy, they're playing and they're struggling with some sort of performance injury, man, whether it's tendonitis or what have you, like how, how do they, um, and, and then they're and then they're really trying to eat better, trying to sleep better, and then trying to figure out like how to exercise. Like I've I, I've thought about that a lot. Like if you've got a performance, it, let's let's say, I mean we could pick a lot of things, but let's say some sort of tendonitis or numbness in the arms a little bit. Like what what should you be possibly doing physically that that can help in terms of like should you be lifting weights? Should you be running, doing yoga? Like what what are some things that you've found that help? And I know it's so specific to every person, but. Uh, well, I think a general level of fitness, and I think it's whatever resonates with one. I think you need to, uh, you need to keep active. I don't think there are any good things to do or bad things to do. Um, there are things to avoid. Uh, and, and this is a big part of what you just said uh, about people having a number of different things sort of creating a perfect storm before they break down. And that's absolutely correct. Uh, uh, the things that, uh, again, the things that, that we try to, to teach are things that carry over into your everyday life as far as posture and breathing and things like that. Um, so we don't want to separate it particularly. Okay, you got to breathe good when you're playing the bass and then go, you know, lay on the couch and whatever, do whatever you want. You know, it's, 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 it's an all around total thing that you need to again understand and embrace um, I would say that some form of exercise is good uh, I just did a video where I showed um, basic exercises that people are doing such as push-ups and yoga and things like that where again if you don't understand how to do those and you're worried about doing the exercise properly you're going to be putting weight on your wrist and bending your wrist, just for one example, in a way that is going to hurt them and going to give you problems. But again, you're like, oh, geez, I got to do three more push-ups. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Or you're like, you know, hey, uh, uh, I'm doing yoga now. I'm, I'm a yoga guy. All right. You know, <laughs> I, hope, I hope she sees that I'm a yoga guy, right? right Whatever right, it right. is, you know. And in that case, you may be worried about your form and again your mind isn't on what your wrists are telling you that they're bending too far so again i i think that video either just came out or is just coming out but that's just one example of that um one thing i would suggest and and there's plenty of people that would uh, perhaps disagree with me on some of these things but uh generally working out wise Free weights are better than machine weights. For musicians, it's the opposite. And the reason for that is because when you do free weights, while it may be a better exercise in general, um, what it also does is there's no parameters there. There's nothing to limit your motion. So your range of motion is how far you can bend your wrist back and forth and turn it around. And that is applicable to any body part. So if you're doing curls with a, uh, a, a bicep curl with a, a dumbbell, right, and you then keep going and keep going and the idea is to do more and more reps and higher weight and that shows you you're having progress, right? So when you do that, you keep straining that area to a certain degree, but there's no limits on how much your wrist is going to bend because you're going to try to do everything you can can to do more 
of that particular weight. And if you have a machine, while you also have settings that you would utilize, it's a pretty straightforward motion. You go in one direction or the other, and the only time your wrist is going to turn excessively is if it sort of slips off or if you're doing too much and it's going to be more of a jerking kind of a motion and you're going to know that something's wrong. So uh, in a nutshell, that whole big uh, thing I just said essentially is about you can control what's happening with machine weights better than you can with free weights. So in, in that regard, that's one thing I would say to consider. That, that, that makes total sense to me. I, that, I, this fall, moving out here to San Francisco, I, I love to run, but I'm also a little clumsy. So every once in a while, I take, I take a tumble. And I took a t uh, kind of a bad tumble and kind of landed on my left wrist. Not too badly, but just enough that I was just feeling some, n just some overall strain. And I, was try and I also like to, I, I run a lot, and I like to lift weights too. And I was trying to continue with my free weights. And I just felt like, I was like caught in this circle where like, okay, I would kind of aggravate it every time I would lift. And I actually moved over to just doing machines and like lighter, lighter weight, you know, just taking it easy. And it, it, it's fine. But I was definitely felt myself trapped in that cycle where like it was like a couple weeks and it wasn't really feeling better. And then I go to the gym and lift and it felt a little, just a little off. And, and yeah, that makes total sense that that, that lack of, of, the, the restriction of parameters with the machines. I can see how that would be helpful for musicians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so that that's that's great that that you have just sort of found that and and that that resonated with you. So uh, um, that's one thing I w I would say. Uh, I find that a lot of people want to do yoga or want to do Pilates. And the overachievers want to do both. I find that doesn't work so well. Uh, that's saying, uh, but I think that usually one resonates with somebody uh, more than the other, and that's usually a better way to go. Um, personal opinion, and from my experience personally and with people that come to my office, I find that people that do both that really taxes them and, uh, and and usually is not a good thing. So again, I'm not I'm not uh, telling anybody they can't or shouldn't do that or, or you know waiting for the flood of angry emails. But uh, uh, I find that usually one or the other is suitable, is good, and will get the job done. Okay. Okay. Great. I'd, I'd love to know, like, how how do you you're you've got such an interesting niche in the world. You know, you're, you're practicing chiropractic, acupuncture, you know, and you're a bassist, and you're helping musicians. Like, I, can you just t take us down? What's the story behind that? You're you're playing bass when you're young, and like, what, did did the medical path was that the path that you did? You always know you wanted to do that, or how how did that all work for you? <laughs> That's that's a that's a, a long question. So I'll try to I'll try to I'll try to keep it uh, uh, somewhat contained. Um, I've always been into music, interested in music. I'm I I started in retail when I was in pre teen when I was a, just turning into a teenager, and I've done everything in the music business from retail to uh, to playing to. Uh, becoming uh, being a partner in a record label to tour managing to everything um and i had a health issue when i was in my 20s when i was on tour with a group and in researching this health issue and in being in a pretty good position, I was uh, I was in Europe and I was touring and I was young and life was good, right? Um, but <clears throat> excuse me, but in going forth from that point, not only in researching this health issue and and getting that sorted out, but just kind of seeing where I was at in life. Um, I realized that to go forward, I would have to go into management to continue my momentum. You know, I didn't want to be in that same place in 10 years, right? So to continue the momentum, I would have to go into management or something like that. And I didn't feel like I really wanted to do that. I felt like that was kind of, you, you have to be a certain person to do that. And that's not who I wanted to be at the time. Um, if you are that person, fantastic. Not me. Um, so uh in 
getting that issue taken care of, a uh, number of other events fell into place where, uh, where it became possible for me to pursue a career in, in health care. Um, I didn't want to uh, be an MD particularly because, again, for me at that time, I didn't want to deal with life and death. Uh, I didn't want to take that upon myself. Uh, I felt that that was kind of heavy. Uh, and, and also, uh, I think to deal with that, there's a certain trade off in your humanity that maybe, uh, in order so you can go home and sleep at night that I wasn't prepared to make. Um, and, uh, and again, that that's uh, no judgment, just that's how I felt. Uh, so, uh, so I went into this and it, it worked out great. Uh, became, uh, was going chiropractic school. All these other things came into play. Um, I started playing more at the time. I hadn't played in several years and I went to, I went to Musicians Institute before this. I went in 1988 to Musicians Institute. My teachers were, uh, Steve Bailey, Gary Willis, uh, Bob Magnuson, Putter Smith, Tim Bogert, Jeff Berlin, uh, Jim Lakesfield. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it was a pretty good time to be going there. Anyway, um, so fast forward, I don't play in a while. I'm starting to play again and I'm starting to get pain in my, in my wrists. And I'm like, wow, what is happening here? Oh, I know what's happening here. <laughs> and I started taking notes about it. And then I reached out to people I hadn't talked to in a while, such as uh, Steve Bailey and, and Putter Smith, and uh, who also one of my, my teachers at MI, and uh, got back in contact and started talking about this stuff and created this niche. And there we are. <laughs> it's fun as a bass, fellow bass player to hear all these things and how they relate directly to our instrument. And you know, I can to I totally understand that that thought of dealing with something like life or death on a daily basis. You know, my wife uh, is a harpist. We met in music school, but she decided to go back to medical school. She's now in the middle of her residency for radiology out here in San Francisco. And I can't help but think almost every day when I come home and when she comes home, how different our daily experiences have been. You know, I, I, I've been a teacher for a long time and we have a saying in, in, in education, there's really no such thing as an educational emergency, you know? <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, that, well, that's it. This is a, and again, I, I applaud anybody waiting, willing to take that responsibility among themselves. The fact is, most people, I, the vast majority of people that I see every day are going to improve because of what I do. So, I mean, what, what's not to like about that, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's a feel good. It feeds, you know, it feeds me too. It makes me feel good about about doing it every day. I love it, you know. Well, and I and I've been I've been checking out. I, I you you mentioned uh, your book, and I I see that you've got interviews with Esperanza in there with yeah. John Clayton. Like, when did you get the idea to this, this? This looks fantastic. When did you get the idea to put this together? Uh, so when I was doing the uh, when I when I started taking notes upon the things that were happening to me when I was going to school and when I was doing this, I realized that. Okay, you know nobody's really done this. I could write a book that uh, that encompassed particular things for the basis, which are things that I'm going through now in real time, and I know a lot of really cool basis, <laughs> and uh, and I could talk to them about it, and and that's exactly what I did. And I created this. Uh, uh, this category from that. And I reached out to friends, as I, I mentioned, and made new friends. And uh, everybody's been incredibly supportive and cool. And and, and uh, I'm able to, to help them in certain ways or able to help me. And it's just, uh, it's just a very, very, uh, very cool, very uh, fun ongoing endeavor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'll make sure to link link up to that so so folks can check it out. And I was I and I'm I love you've got a, a musical example from Basscapes, the album you put together. And I love this. Uh, can you just talk about that a little bit? When you got the idea to put this together, what it is? Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, I started Basscapes recently with a, a Chicago bassist named Chris Clemente, who's a, been a friend of mine were, since high school, and uh, and uh, he's given me lessons, and we played together, and we've got a, a really strong friendship for a long time. 
Um, so I have massage therapists that work in my office and I get massages on a regular basis and I listen to the music they play and I go, wow, I could do that. So yeah, <laughs> um, it's not strictly massage music. I don't want it to be associated with any particular category. Like I don't want to call it yoga works or anything like that. Although it could definitely fit that category. Um, so I said to Chris, I said, hey, we could do some music like this and it would be fun and we'll get to collaborate and we can do it all, in, you know, in the bedroom, essentially, with, with logic. And, you know, it's the, the time time now that you can do that kind of stuff. So he said, absolutely, let's do it. So we sit down and we just start playing. And the idea is that Bassscapes is... Uh, music for, I call it, relaxation and exploration. Uh, what we do is we lay down some some bass riffs, but not with the intention of, of showing, uh, certainly having musicality, but not showing we can play this or these are our riffs or or I want a bassist to hear this and, and think that, that this is really slick. It's for the intention of putting on and almost being like an afterthought. You hear the music like you would in a relaxing situation, a massage, a spa, etc., and it becomes part of the experience. And you hear it, and it's pleasant, and it, it adds to the, uh, the experience that you're going with, but, but still has some personality. So that's this case. It's great, and I, I just, I, you've got such a fascinating and varied career. It must just be so satisfying, and I, I, I love just going to the mu music institute or musicians institute, right, and studying with all those amazing players and getting involved in the music business in all those different ways you're describing. Becoming a doctor, you're recording, you're you're helping people on a daily basis, you're working with the ISB. It's just such a cool. Uh, cool career you created for yourself. So I just, I, I applaud you for what you're doing and it's just really exciting to see what you're up to. I, I've got, I, and I never have any scripted questions for, for these. I just like chatting with people just like as if we were hanging out. But I do have, I, I guess, I, I, I do have kind of one general question I like to ask people and just like you've done, I mean, talk about a wide portfolio of experiences and and, and if you could just rewind to, you could pick the age, maybe 16-year-old Randy, 18-year-old Randy. Knowing what you know now, what advice might you give that younger self? And I apologize for the extremely open question. but No, no, that, that's fine. Well, I wouldn't give myself any advice because I did what I, I always did what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think I would give myself any advice. But if it was someone else, I would tell them, you can you can do ex I'm, you can do exactly what you want to do. Uh, and it, it sounds cliched, it sounds trite, uh, and it may be to some degree, but it's absolutely the truth. You can create whatever you you want your existence and your daily life to be. And for somebody with uh, three kids and and no health insurance and you know and and and. Not a lot of prospects in the world seems to to be a dark place in, in the moment. I understand that's a lot of fancy talk. I get that. But, you know, there were times when when I had to uh, go go work jobs I didn't want to work and do things I didn't want to do and not get paid for things. And, and I, you know, I paid my dues. I created what I had, but it, it, it didn't just come to me. Uh, people didn't just call me and say, hey, can we give you this and can this happen for you? You got to make it happen. So you have to you have to sort of figure out what you want and go for it. And and that's all that really matters. Everything else is really um, is, is is a detail. A detail that needs to be worked out, but a detail nonetheless. <laughs> Thanks again, Randy, for chatting. So great to chat with you, and I can't wait to see you at ISB this summer. Folks, check out everything he's up to at drkurtz.com. And that's going to do it for another episode of Contrabass Conversations. I'm so glad to have you along on this journey with me through these hundreds of conversations with all these bass players, all over the world. I really hope you're enjoying this, whether this is your first episode or your 300th episode. Thank you for listening and taking the time. And 
If you'd ever like to reach out, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. I respond to each and every message. If you don't have the app, there's all sorts of extra content available in the app, and the app is also free and available for iOS, Android, and Kindle. And that's at ContrabassConversations.com slash app. Thank you again for listening, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.